So some days, uh, I'm doing real well. Uh, I feel strong, I feel like I've got it all together, you know, uh, almost like I'm invincible. <laughs> I remember one time years ago, and I was uh, just around 28, 29, something like that, I was having this chest pain, I went to the doctor to see him, and he did all these tests on me, and then he looked at me and he laughed, and he said, you're 29, you're invincible, relax, you know. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess I'm fine, you know, I should just take it easy. Anyway, some days I feel strong. And like, like I can take on the world, and other days, I feel like the world's caving in on me. Anybody else like that? Uh, some days I feel like I want to meet people and connect with people and love and care for people, and then other days, I don't want to see anyone, right? I just want to crawl in a hole and <laughs> disappear. Um, some days I feel like I have great faith and great hope, uh, and, and, and other days, I just feel tired, and exhausted. Uh, some days I feel like I have clarity about my life and my purpose, and other days I feel like I'm in a fog, and like uh, I don't even know which way is up. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture today that has been uh, throughout history uh, a real powerful passage for people who are facing anxiety or doubt or worry or exhaustion or guilt or depression or discouragement or people who are just facing a hard time. So if you're here today, <laughs> And you're in that space in one way or another if you're feeling overwhelmed or tired or inadequate or weak or if you feel a sense of maybe shame or doubt or anxiety. Um, I got good news for you today. I mean, this service, this message is just for you. And if you're here and you're sort of the opposite, you're like, man, I feel like I got it all together today. My life is perfect. You know? Then this sermon's not for you. <laughs> just saying. You can just relax and sit back and just kind of say it's for somebody else, you know? That's great. Um, so if it's not for you, I just encourage you to come back next week, though, because I'm pretty sure next week you're going to need it, right? You'll probably be there, because uh, all of us have those, those days. Anyway, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 23. It's a psalm about a man and his God, and he uses the metaphor of being a sheep. So he says, it's about me and my God, a man and his God, but it's really about a sheep and his shepherd. And sheep are, they're, they're, they're kind of funny animals. Um, sheep are a, a domesticated animal. They're farmed. They're, 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 they, they come under shepherds. And what makes them unique, especially in the days when, when this psalm was written, but also today, is just how, how vulnerable sheep are. Um, sheep have almost no defenses. Like when a predator comes, and sheep have lots of predators, Sheep don't do anything. They just, you know, like, they're just, they're super vulnerable animals. Um, there, there's hardly such a thing as a wild sheep. Um, there are wild sheep, like mountain sheep and things like that, but they are so far removed from the domesticated version, from the shepherded kind of sheep, that you can't imagine, and certainly the readers of, of uh, our text today couldn't have imagined um, a, a sheep that would be able to survive on its own without a shepherd. And it's just not possible. Um, if a sheep is not shepherded well, it easily gets uh, diseases, bugs, and so on. Um, it, it quite easily can be wounded. Actually, um, shepherds would, would pour oil and put a special kind of oil over a sheep's head to keep the bugs and the diseases uh, from setting in, and also uh, for healing for the various wounds that a sheep would get. Um, but a sheep is actually a, a very skittish animal. They're easily afraid. They're easily distressed. Um, they, they need to be kind of cared for and comforted. And if not, if a sheep is allowed to be constantly under stress, they will actually die of fear. Uh, it's part of a, they're, they're quite vulnerable that way. Um, and if a sheep is not led to the right places, both for uh, feeding and for drinking, um, a sheep is not real wise enough to make good choices in those areas, and a, a sheep will actually uh, eat itself to death, it'll eat poisonous things and uh, drink from places that'll make it sick and so on. Uh, sheep also often get lost, um, they don't know very good at finding their way, uh, they can often find themselves stuck, they just wander into places where they get stuck, and if a shepherd doesn't come and rescue them, um, that sheep will actually die there, just stuck, unable to get themselves out. And so the Bible um, maybe not very flatteringly, actually likens you and me to sheep, okay? Um, and the reason it likens us to sheep, there's a lot of discussion actually about whether sheep are stupid animals. I don't know if you knew that, but 
It's like, uh, you know, and some people say, oh, you know, we're like sheep. We're kind of dumb like you. Uh, sheep are actually pretty smart as far as animals go. Um, they're actually uh, a little dumber than a pig and about the same as a cow, which isn't exactly flattering either, right? I mean, it's, they're not rocket scientists, that's for sure. Um, but they're, they're pretty smart as far as animals go. But anyway, we're, we're like sheep, not, not so much in our brains, but, but in the, our vulnerability, in the fact that we need a shepherd just like a sheep needs a shepherd. And we have to admit to ourselves, when, when we're honest, that, that, you know, like I said earlier, some days we're doing pretty good, but the reality is for all of us, um, we struggle. We have our challenges. We have our problems. And uh, we don't always make the best choices and so on. And actually, uh, Jesus said this about uh, when, how, who God blesses. He's making this list of blessings from God. And he says this, God blesses those who are poor and recognize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's those very people who say, yeah, you know what? I need God. Um, I'm going to let down my posing and my pride and my acting like I have it all together. And I, I just acknowledge I need God. Now, one of the fascinating things I found out studying sheep is that sheep, they're so vulnerable that they actually have this thing where they flip upside down and they can't stand back up. It's kind of like a beetle. You ever seen a beetle do that, flipped upside down, can't get righted? Um, it's, called, it's called a cast sheep. This literally happens. Um, it's crazy. And so when a sheep is cast, they just lie there, you know, and just bleed. And if they're not rescued by they'll die just lying there if a, a shepherd doesn't come and rescue them. Um, so this is a cast sheep. Actually, David... Uh, in Psalm 42 and 43, he uses this phrase, why are you downcast, O my soul? That's a shepherding phrase. I have a downcast soul. <laughs> I'm just, I can't right myself. My life's flipped upside down and I can't straighten my life out. You ever felt that way? Man, I've been there. I just, ah, I can't, can't find my way. He tells his soul, put your hope in God. Let God write you. So a, a, a shepherd has to come to a sheep like this, carefully write it, depending on how long it's been that way. Um, the, the, he actually has to do it quite wisely, the gas is in their stomach, all these problems. And then uh, because they've been lying like that, they're, the, all the blood runs from their legs and they can't stand up. And so if they just, if the, if the shepherd just writes them and sets them down, he'll just flop right over and flip upside down again. So, so what they do is they'll hold them up for a while and rub their legs until the blood gets back running into their legs again. And then the sheep can hop off and, and be happy again. Um, but the point is, the point is, we need a shepherd, and we are vulnerable without God. And David, in Psalm chapter 23, is really just rejoicing that he has a shepherd. Um, he's rejoicing in this good news, because David knows himself. David is a man of many passions. He gets pulled this way and that. He has good days and bad days. And David has discovered that when he leans into God, that he is the best version of himself. And that when he doesn't, when he wanders his own way and, 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 and comes out from under the shepherd, he uh, discovers that uh, he's not as strong as he might think he is. And so Psalm 23 is really the, the overflow of a guy who's just thrilled in his God. He's thrilled that, that he has the shepherd that he has, and he's celebrating that. And basically, he's just saying, you have got to meet this God that I know. You've got to get to know him because he's incredible. And if you come, or, uh, come under him as a, a sheep under a shepherd, you will be so glad you did. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this psalm to you. And if you have a Bible, you can turn there, Psalm 23. I'm going to read it to you. And as I read it to you, uh, my prayer this morning is actually that God would just do a kind of renewing work in all of us. That God would renew our strength. Um, one little verse in this psalm just says, he restores my soul or he renews my strength and and as we are heading into this fall season, um, I know for me personally, as the, the, the season ramps up and we get busy and life goes hard, and uh, even the last few weeks as a pastor, I've been calling you to, to uh, serving and to fulfilling the call of God and being the church and all these things. And uh, I know uh, when, when, when life speeds up, uh, I have to pull back and just go, okay, Lord, I got to make sure I'm doing the Psalm 23 thing in the midst of the, the speed of life. Does that make sense? That, that I need to make sure that I'm keeping a healthy soul and uh, uh, keeping myself renewed in God 
uh, it, during these kinds of seasons. So that's my prayer for all of us and, and uh, for each of you here today. So I'm going to read this psalm, and as I do, uh, I just, just listen to what God would speak over you um, to declare to you as your shepherd. So verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can rest in the provision of God. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You can be renewed in God's strength today. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God wants to guide you today along his paths. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God wants to give you courage in his presence, even in the dark places, in the trials of your life. It goes on to say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So even in your trials, even in your difficulties, you can be drenched with the blessing of God, the, the peace of God in your life. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're being pursued by a loving and a good God, and he wants his love and his goodness to, to be a part of your life uh, all your days. That's a pretty cool blessing. That's a pretty cool reality if we're willing to step into that and live inside of that. And what we're going to do with the time that remains is we're just going to walk through line by line this psalm, um, and uh, we're just going to invite God by his spirit to speak into our lives through his word. So the, the psalm starts with the word, the Lord. This is really Jehovah. It actually starts and ends. So the, the beginning of the psalm, right? Jehovah is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And then it ends with, in the house of Jehovah forever. So it starts with Jehovah, Jehovah forever. That's the start. That's the end. And really, the whole psalm is not about the sheep. It's about the shepherd, the whole psalm. Um, it's, it's about this awesome God. And, and any Jewish person, any Hebrew person who was reading this would be like, oh, Jehovah, he's great, he's awesome, he's magnificent. He's good and he's kind. But it's really the next word that's radical about this psalm. It says, Jehovah is my. He uses a personal pronoun. Uh, Martin Luther used to say, great faith comes from personal pronouns. Great faith comes from personal pronouns. When, when, when you don't just take the truths of Scripture or the ideas of God and say, yeah, they're, they're generally true. But when you say they are true for me here and now, that's, that's where faith comes into play. That's where th these truths become reality for you. In fact, uh, this is a huge, huge deal uh, for me personally because this is really what changed my life as a young man. Um, I grew up in a wonderful Christian home. I learned God's word. I learned the principles of God's word. Uh, I, I, I heard phrases like personal relationship with Jesus. That was a common catchphrase in my uh, growing up, my understanding of, of my faith. You know, you, we get to have this personal relationship with Jesus. Somehow, as I grew up, all those phrases about God, all the ideas about God in my life, I believed them. I believed they were true. I just didn't know them as reality. Um, maybe let me put it this way. I knew that I could have a personal relationship with Jesus and thought that I did. I just didn't know I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. <laughs> You're like, what do you mean? I mean, I didn't know I could talk to Jesus like I can talk to you. Or you, or you, or you, right? I didn't, I didn't know I could know him like I know many of you and have a relationship with many of you. How, how do I have a relationship with somebody? Well, that's not a... An idea up here in the nebula somewhere, it's, it's reality. Did you get that? You see, in, in almost every religion around the world, it's real easy for people to talk about ideas, about philosophies, about beliefs. It's a whole nother thing when you start making that personal. Christianity is radical and is different than other religions, not because it claims to be true. Right? Most religious ideas claim to be true. It's radical because it claims to be real, like actually real, like not just an idea to talk about, but a reality to live. Uh, um, let me put it this way. Christianity at its core is not a set of beliefs 
or a set of philosophies or a way of life, a set of behaviors. It includes all of those things, but at its core, it's a relationship with the living God. It's a reality. It's something you, you experience. Let me put it that way. Experiential reality is very different than ideological thoughts. And what the psalmist does here is he says, Jehovah is my shepherd, right? It's my reality. This is not just something to, uh, about. Uh, in fact, in, in the Old Testament, this is a common way to talk about God. It's a, Jehovah is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider. Your provider, right? It's, it's God, but God made personal. God brought into your reality. I shall not want, right? He's Jehovah Jireh. Or Jehovah Shalom, right? He's the Lord, your peace, right? Makes me lie down in green pastures or leads me beside still waters, that kind of thing. Or He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer, right? Again, this is brought to bear on my life, your life, an individual's life at a given moment in time. This is God made present or made... In fact, uh, uh, one of the, the, the names for God is Jehovah Shammah, which is just the God who is here, the God who's with me, present. Um, and that's, that's the, the wonderful reality that the psalmist invites us into uh, one writer describes it this way. He says, it's this, it's God made personal that turns sheep into wolf chasers, mice into men, inadequate people into adequate in the Lord. And, and I'll just, from my own experience as a 15-year-old young man, to, to go, oh my goodness, this Jesus that I believe in, this Jesus that I talk about, this Jesus that's a, a great idea is actually real? is actually a person I can know. I mean, it changed everything for me. Then suddenly talking about freedom or joy or satisfaction in Christ or, or delighting in God, all of a sudden those terms made sense to me. All of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, well, if, if you can actually know him, be with him, enjoy him, um, it changed everything for me. So the Lord is my shepherd. It's a common term in scripture. And really, what it means when it says God's our shepherd is that he is our owner and our provider, right? Um, as shepherd, he rules and guides and feeds and protects. And as sheep, we follow, we obey, we love, and we trust. And of course, not everybody in scripture is termed a sheep. Um, there are actually goats, right, and wolves. And part of the question we have to ask ourselves right at the outset, the Lord is my shepherd, is, is, is the Lord your shepherd? Is the Lord really my shepherd or, or am I not one of his sheep? You know, sheep and goats can be uh, side by side eating in a field, but uh, only one of them has that shepherd, right? And what, what's the difference? Well, I think one of the big differences is that a goat just does his own thing, right? Yeah. You know, goats just on his own. And the sheep is trusting and loving and coming under the leadership of the shepherd. Um, and there's a sense in which I think what the psalmist is saying here is he's saying, I am content to be under the leadership of Jehovah. I am content to be under God's management, God's ownership. There's a kind of freedom and contentment and joy and confidence that comes there. And really, the lot in the life of a sheep depends a lot on the character of their shepherd, right? You can tell a lot about a sheep. I've been reading about this all week, and uh, you, you, the shepherds will tell you that you can tell a lot about a shepherd by the state of their sheep. Or maybe the other way to say it is when you look at a group of sheep, you can, you know, you can tell some things about who manages, who runs them. And, and really, the whole rest of this psalm is, 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 is to declare that. Because God is my shepherd, uh, he, my life expresses the character of God, shows what a good shepherd I have. And the, the first statement is, I shall not want. I mean, this is actually a pretty radical statement. I have everything I need, some translations put it. God is my shepherd. I have no wants. I have everything I need. You say, well, how can a person possibly say that? I mean, that's way too big. That's way too radical. Listen, saying Jehovah is my shepherd that's radical, right? Saying God is the shepherd of my life, that's the radical statement. 
Now, what follows that is only natural. If God, the God of the universe, is shepherding my life, then I really can have everything I need. I can have all my wants, my needs met. You may say, well, wow, that sounds, still sounds pretty big and pretty fantastic. Um, when you think about how humans work, human beings are really a, a bundle of desires. That's what we are. We are, we are like wanting, needing machines. Okay? We, we need things. We want things. We're consumers, right? This is how we're wired. We need, we want. We go around our lives, you know, just filled with desire, filled with longing. Um, and, and it's part of the human condition that we live that way. Um, but what the, the, the message of Scripture is, maybe the main message of Scripture, is that the greatest discovery you can make is that all your longings, all your needs are wrapped up in the God who made you for himself. That really, when you find God, you find ultimate fulfillment, ultimate satisfaction. That God himself is that. And actually, the teaching of Scripture is that when we look to other things to be ultimately fulfilling to us, when we look to other things to, to satisfy us outside of God, the Bible calls those idols, calls that idolatry. If, if we say things like, what I really need is blank, whatever goes in the blank is our God, right? What I really need is a boyfriend or girlfriend, or what I really need is more money, or what I really need is a job. What I really need is just to catch a break for once in my life, right? What I really need is a vacation, right? Whatever that, what I really need is blank. That's, that's God to us. And David just goes, man, when you find your ultimate satisfaction in God, in this good shepherd, you step back and you just go, oh, I'm full. I'm full. I'm rich. And David's not saying he has no problems. <laughs> He's, he goes through a lot of trials. If you read about the life of David in Scripture, he has all kinds of problems. So he's not saying, oh, God's my shepherd, therefore he takes away every problem in my life. He just makes my life easy. Right? Not even close. But what he is saying is that in the midst of the trials of my life, God is with me, and it's him that's enough. I rest in him and his provision for me. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want... He makes me lie down in green pastures. Um, this is really just talking about God's provision, right? This is feeding green pastures. And, and lying down, um, the picture is of, of a, a sheep that is contented. Um, actually, sheep don't lie down unless they have all their needs met. I mentioned already they're very skittish, so if they feel afraid at all, they won't lie down. Um, if they're hungry at all, they won't lie down. If they're bothered by flies and, and bugs and so on, they won't lie down. It's when they finally have all their needs met that they just rest. Um, Charles Spurgeon thinks that the uh, reference to green pastures is actually talking about just coming and feeding on the word of God. That God provides for us uh, by giving us his word and that we feed on God's word. Uh, one thing I've been hearing about lately, which I've just been loving, this year, I think more than ever in our church, I'm hearing about people in our church falling in love with the Word of God, just reading God's Word and, 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 and spending time every day in God's Word. We have a Bible reading program we do. You can use our church app or uh, one of the bookmarks in the lobby. Um, but I keep hearing about people who are just going, yeah, I'm spending time in, in the Word every day. Or uh, I've heard a few people soaping God's Word, which is a strategy we use to to work through a scripture together. and Anyway, you can do that, but I just, as you get into God's word and allow yourself to feed on the right things, what happens is you lose your appetite for junk food. Isn't that right? And uh, you have an appetite for, for the things of God. He leads me beside still waters. Uh, the picture here is a picture of refreshing. Um, I think it's probably referring to being in the presence of God or with the Holy Spirit. Usually water in Scripture has some sense of, of uh, being uh, filled with God's Spirit. But actually, for sheep, if they're brought to a, a, a quick-flowing river, it can actually be quite dangerous for a sheep. As they try to drink from a fast-flowing river, um, a sheep can slip in, but more likely they get some of their wool caught in the water and uh, that gets weighted down, and it drags them in. They can drown. Um, so a shepherd is quite careful to bring sheep to uh, a, a stiller water, a, a, a water that's not flowing very fast. 
Um, and I think in the frenzy of our world, and this is so much of what is happening in Psalm 23, in the frenzy of our world, in the chaos of our world, in the frenzy of life, because life is just that way, um, we're invited to come and be still in the presence of God. We're invited to come and just find a, a place of rest. And, and I, I know for me many times when life is, is going at 110 miles an hour, um, even just pausing sometimes in the middle of my day and just going, okay, Jesus, you're with me right now. Fill me afresh with your spirit. Help me have that still center with you. Um, I think it's real important. I was reading this week about a shepherd who uh, would often lead his sheep uh, to a certain area of water, spring of water, and on the way to that water was uh, some muddier grounds, and uh, grounds where obviously the sheep and other animals had walked through many times. And he said, inevitably, a few of the sheep, even with the good water, clean water in view, would stop and drink in the mud. <laughs> He's like, it was full of manure and gunk and just, you know, he knew it would disease the sheep and be bad for them. And he would have to go and, you know, shove them on and say, come on, leave that, that garbage behind and head to the cleaner waters. Now, Jeremiah 2.13, God speaking, he says, my people have done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water. It's a good reminder for us to, you know, regularly step back and go, what, what sort of places am I looking to for refreshing in my life? Am I really feeding on, you know, good grounds and drinking from clean waters. And, of course, as we do that, God restores our soul. He renews our strength. Um, it's that little line that got me to, to preach this. Uh, sometimes I do what I call a dashboard. I just stop and look at my life and ask myself, how am I doing? How's the dashboard of my life going? Because I want to check all the tanks and make sure, you know, none of them are getting too close to empty. Um, so I ask myself that physically. Sometimes I can get physically run down. Just how am I doing physically? How's the, the tank physically? And I'll ask it spiritually. How am I doing spiritually? Is, it, is my tank full or is it halfway or is it getting towards empty? Do I need to do something to refuel my, my spiritual tanks? But then the, the one I always ask last, and it's always the hardest one for me to answer, is actually emotionally. Um, how am I doing emotionally? Am I getting depleted emotionally? And maybe it's because I'm a man, but sometimes I'm not very in touch with my emotions. Anybody else that ever happened to you, men or women? No. Um, so, so sometimes I need to just pause and ask this. You know, am I, am I depleting myself? Have I lost touch there? And do I need to get back and just get restored? Invite God to replenish my life. Um, and of course, God loves to do that. Uh, as life has a way of wearing on us and bumping us out of alignment, um, God restores. And, and it's likely in actually that little phrase there, that's where I got the, the idea from, that uh, quite a few uh, writers and shepherds and commentators of Scripture think that uh, David is probably talking here about a cast sheep, like a sheep that's got flipped upside down. <laughs> it's just going, God, I need you to restore my soul. I've lost my way here, and I need you. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So God knows the right paths for us to take. And, and he leads us down those right paths. So, the Bible actually says that God's paths are paths that drip with abundance, and they're the paths of life. Um, and, and really, I think the, the psalmist here is just saying, we need to walk in obedience to God. Do you know that there's actually tremendous comfort in choosing to be a sheep who obeys the shepherd? Uh, sometimes we think, you know, oh, I just want to do my own thing or go my own way or live my life. You know, God, leave me alone. But actually, trying to figure out the best way to live your life without God's help is actually pretty stressful and pretty crazy. Uh, there's, there is strength in just pre-making your decisions in life and just going, when I know the will of God, I'm going to follow God. When I know what God would want me to do, I'm just going to choose God's way. And then when pressures come or stresses come or peer pressure comes this way, that way, you just go, it's easy. Decision's already made. I'm a sheep and I have a shepherd. I go his way. And, and I think it's worth mentioning, particularly here, um, sometimes we think we know better than God. Right? 
And sometimes we're like, ah, I know God's way is this way, but I'd rather that way. Or, you know, I, it feels like almost like the, the, one of the lies that, the, that sin uses is, wow, God's just trying to wreck your life. He's trying to wreck your fun. Listen, God is a loving shepherd. He's leading you down the path. He's leading you down. He's telling you the direction in your life because he wants good things for you. And we live in a culture that sometimes says, you know, well, you know, you should live this way. And it goes against God's word. Now, listen, church, please hear me on this. When culture and God's word disagree, and, and we take a stand on God's word, and we say, no, this is the way human beings were meant to live. This is the path of righteousness that is for human beings. Um, and culture kind of goes, ah, you know, you're just trying to ruin our fun. We have to lovingly say back, no, no, nobody's trying to ruin your fun. This is God's loving instruction to help us live our lives better ways. And you can look, you can look in your own life and you can look in lots of other places in our world where people abandon the paths of God for their own ways thinking they know better and they head down paths of destruction. Okay, so he leads me down the right paths for his name's sake. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is actually the center of the psalm, and, and it's actually the, the, the place in the psalm where things, uh, they were already personal, but they just get even more. Because up until now, you have sort of this sense in the psalm that life is really good for this sheep. Like, he just takes it easy, and it's sweet, and he's got green pastures and still waters, and it's so nice, and it's so gooey and so sappy and so surreal right? It's like, really? Really? Like, life is like that for you? Because it hasn't been for me, right? Um, and, and the psalmist goes, no, 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 no. There's seasons. Yes, God does take us to those places where he refreshes and restores us, but there's also some dark valleys I've been through. The New Living Translation calls this, you know, even though I walk through the darkest valley, there's dark valleys. And what's amazing about this this part of the psalm is this is where things turn. This has actually been, this verse has been a real strength to me uh, in this last season of my life and in many different seasons of my life. But what's cool about it is the psalmist changes from uh, talking about God impersonally um, to talking to God. So he says, the Lord is, the Lord is. And then from here on in the psalm, he says, you, you are God. He, he as he goes through the dark valley, who God is, becomes God who you are. God comes close to him. And of course, that's what he declares. Because God, you are with me. You're with me. Richard Foster says, God becomes a reality when he becomes a necessity. David Roper says, the dark valleys make God more real to us than ever before. And of course, the idea isn't that we just go into the valley. The idea is that God is taking us through the valley. And we fear no evil in that place because we know the presence of God in that place. And for many of us, it's those dark valleys where we have come to know God in a more personal, more intimate, closer kind of way in our lives. Um, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. This is awesome. <laughs> the picture is of a, a sheep just enjoying a feast with, with wolves kind of pacing around, licking their chops, you know, just wishing they could eat that sheep, but not being able to because the shepherd is right there. And the sheep just enjoying his meal without a care in the world, right, for that wolf, because he knows God's with him. <laughs> Another fun Martin Luther story. Uh, Martin Luther tells a story of one time he woke up in the night, he heard a sound downstairs, and he walks downstairs, and the devil was sitting in his living room, and he smiled and said, oh, it's only you. Went back to sleep. <laughs> if God's with me, right? It's not that the devil's not a formidable foe. He is. We ought to be wise about how we handle that. But if God be with me, who can be against me? Amen. Right? And it's just, I, I, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I know that whatever happens, God has got me. I have the finest dining in the worst of circumstances. You anoint my head with oil, right? Protection, healing. My cup overflows. There's a sort of contentment and a joy 
and overflowing there. And we're, we're kind of heading to the end of the psalm here. And he's just saying, my, God has not only filled my life, but he's filled me so much that now that blessing overflows. So actually my prayer, I talk about this often with our church, that we would be the kind of place where we feel so blessed by God, so enriched by God's goodness in our lives, that we don't live our lives for the blessing, but we live our lives to be a blessing, right? To serve and bless and, and minister to others and to our city and so on. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is pursuing me with his goodness and love. And really, the, the picture of my life is just a testimony to the goodness of my shepherd. Nothing could make me want to leave this place, this house of the Lord. It's great. So there's David, thrilled in his God, thrilled in his good shepherd, so thankful. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, has kind of the opposite picture. He looks at a crowd of people, and his heart goes out with compassion to them. And he says, he, he looks at them and he says, man, I, I feel compassion for these people because they're harassed and helpless or confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's a bunch of people, they're sheep without a shepherd. And I think it's just such a great contrast to think between this picture right here and the picture in Matthew 9, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And of course, the invitation to all of us is Let's come under our shepherd. Let's come close to our shepherd. Let's live our life in that space. Uh, one last cool thought. Psalm 23 comes right after Psalm 22. I know that probably doesn't blow your minds. It's pretty clear. But you know what the last words of Psalm 22 are? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So prophetic words about the Messiah hanging on the cross. And there's no green pastures or still waters before Psalm 22, before Christ dies on the cross and makes provision so that we can come to the Good Shepherd. And there's something wonderful about just being able to say, Jesus is our Good Shepherd. He's the door, right? He's the means by which we come to God.